So we finally made it to the sixth and final source of Unitarian Universalism, which is the spiritual teachings of Earth-centered traditions which celebrate the sacred circle of life and instruct us to live in harmony with the rhythms of nature. And this reading is one I absolutely love for many, many reasons, and it's uh, called Vibrant, it's a kind of, it's a, con a bridged version of a reading called Vibrant, Juicy, Contemporary, or Why I Am a UU Pagan. And it was written by Margot Adler. Now, Margot, the late Margot Adler was many things, um, but not most notably, she was a correspondent for what I like to call the UU Voice of God, known most to most people as National Public Radio. She writes, when I was five, I asked my father what religion we were. An atheist from a nominal, nominally Jewish background, he told me, we believe in the brotherhood of man. Meanwhile, my mother was saying, you're Jewish. And my father was saying, no, we're not. So I come from a background of religious confusion and even conflict. My father, although Jewish, had actually been brought up in a Lutheran household, and he celebrated Christmas, a tradition my family continued. Then two things happened that really affected me spiritually. First, when I was 10 years old, our entire class celebrated May Day. Going out to the country to pick flowers, singing medieval May Day carols, and, and dancing around the Maypole. And I became a ritual junkie for life. Then we studied ancient Greece for the entire seventh grade. This was in 1957. I was reading about Artemis and Athena, those incredible Greek goddesses. I decided way down deep I didn't want to worship them. I wanted to be them. They were the most powerful images of confidence and inner strength I had seen in the society I was growing up in. But by the time I was 14, I realized you do not go around worshiping the Greek gods or pretending you are them without ending up in a mental hospital. <laughs> so I hid this stuff in, my, in psychic storage, you might say, and went on with my life. Then, in 1970, right around the time of the first Earth Day, I started reading nature writers like Thoreau and Rachel Carson. Although I found myself excited and energized by the ecology movement, my response to these writings was not entirely political. As I read these writers, I was having what I could only describe now as religious feelings. I saw that this literature was about our whole relationship to the universe. It showed that everything was interconnected. It helped me understand my place in the universe in a way I had never understood it before. Soon after that, I came across essays that profoundly affected me, one by Arnold Toynbee and the other by Lynn White. They said to me there was a problem with the command in Genesis to have dominion over the earth. This notion put human beings above nature, gave us license to destroy the earth. The essays also talked about the older pagan animistic traditions and their different notions of the divine, that it was present, present in everything and that everything was alive and vital. I began to think this, that this older perspective gave one, one a more sacred sense of the planet and a reluctance to destroy the earth. I thought, that's what I've always believed. And I started looking for an ecological religion. I did really silly things. I went to England and I looked under druids in the telephone directory. <laughs> but slowly I became aware of an entire movement, which I will call the Earth-Centered Traditions including anything from indigenous traditions to contemporary pagan forms to people who are reviving the goddess spirituality movement to Wicca to people who are re reviving Nordic religions to people who are looking at what their ancestors were involved in 3,000 or 4,000 or 5,000 years ago and trying to create that again in a more contemporary way. Paganism today is a minority religious tradition and it will probably never be a majority tradition in this country. It doesn't even see itself as being a religion for everyone, but it has certain insights that are useful for anyone about living in this world. 
Now, most major religions we're familiar with have many similarities. They have, for example, written scripture and prophets, usually wise men, who have come down to tell humans about how to live their lives. They have rules, and many of them see themselves as universal religions that is appropriate for all people and all places. I think we've grown up thinking these characteristics, things like scripture and creed and rules and prophets, are what makes up a religion. But the traditions I'm talking about don't have any of these characteristics. They don't have written scripture. They don't have a very well-formed creed. Rather, these religions, which are the religions of our ancestors 40,000 years ago, are based on practice as opposed to belief. These practices are all based on community and seasonal cycles, the doing, the planting, the harvesting, and they're not based on creed or written scripture. Indigenous religion, by definition, is not universal. It's based on place. Native American nations and cultures have their sacred mountains, their sacred spots. Indigenous traditions don't get involved in proselytizing because they don't assume that other people should even be part of their religious tradition. This is a huge notion because if you don't proselytize, how could you possibly ever have a religious war? <laughs> Another thing I found was that because these earth-centered traditions were based on oral tradition and not the written word, like the word in capital W, they were much more metaphorical and theologically more flexible. I believe the reviving interest in earth-centered religions is a reaction to what I would call our white bread culture. If you go back far enough into anyone's ancestry, you will find that we all had earth-based traditions ripped from us. They had songs, they had stories, they had lullabies, they had ceremonies, they had dances. Very often, by contrast, the religion we've been brought up in is fairly white bread. You know, you sit there in the pew and some minister or, minister or rabbi lectures at you. Go figure. So a lot of the pagan movement today, including a lot of the Wicca movement, is based on going back to our ancestors' traditions or creating them anew, since many of these traditions have been lost. It's an attempt to create a vibrant, juicy, contemporary culture based on old sources, on what our ancestors were doing, or at least a tiny slice of what they were doing thousands of years ago. Now that I've told you how wonderful these Earth-centered traditions are, you may be wondering why I became a Unitarian Universalist. If the pagan and goddess traditions were giving me so much, why did I need an official religion, let alone a church? To be truthful about it, not everything comes from personal experience and revelation. There are times when gut and heart and intuition are just not enough. I believe that things of this world and this existence matter and that the sacred resides in the here and the now. I love the fact that Unitarian Universalists have a good many atheists and humanists among them. After all, it's important to have a reality check, to have people who will bring us down to earth and say, stop all this intuitive garbage and look at the reality. This is a ceiling, this is a table, this is a floor. And by the way, get out of that trance and look at that homeless guy lying in the street. I guess I chose UUism because I need to live in balance. I can do all of those wonderful earth-centered spiritual things, sing under the stars, drum for hours, create moving ceremonies for the changes of the seasons or the passage of time in the lives of people. But I also need to be a worldly, down-to-earth person in a complicated world someone who believes oppression is real and that tragedies happen. Of course, there are many rational, rationalists within the Earth-centered community, but somehow I feel more centered in this denomination. And I think, in turn, the pagan community has brought to UUism the joy of ceremony and a lot of creative and artistic ability that will leave the denomination with a richer liturgy and a bit more juice and mystery. All right, so that's Mar Margot Adler. And you probably by now have an idea of why I love her so much. And I chose this reading because it really does kind of cover two bases here. It gives us a lot of background on, and information on Earth-centered traditions. But at the same time, Margot Adler's telling her personal theological story. 
And it really paints a powerful picture and provides us an example of how a Unitarian Universalist can kind of look at their lives and realize and develop their own personal theologies, the theology that allows them the best way to connect with something greater. Now last week, which was, uh, we talked about humanism, I shared a more academic kind of reading. Um, and then I shared my, pers my own personal theology around humanism kind of towards the same end, to tell a theological story, to kind of think about how we all can have these stories. So today I'm going to tell you about my Earth-centered story, too. And it's not because I have the best or the most interesting Earth-centered theology. In fact, my Earth-centered Earth -centered theology is still very much under construction. But what my story can do, it can show you how Earth-centered theology can be incorporated into a person's personal theology, even if you don't call yourself a Wiccan or a pagan or consider any other of these traditions as your primary theology. But first I'm going to rewind a little bit and talk UUA church business because I want to tell you how we got our sixth source because that's an interesting story in itself. Originally there really were only five sources. And you re may remember that our sources appeared in 1984. It was a time when they were, they were revising our original principles. So in 1984, we got a seventh principle about the interdependent web. And in this debate about how to reorganize the principles, they came up with something called the sources. So 84, we got principles and sources, but there were only the first five. It turns out that um, the sixth source did not come out come out until 11 years later, until 1995. So that's the most recent of all of our principles and sources. And like any change or addition to UU principles and sources, it's a long, drawn out, but essentially democratic process. It starts with groups and committees and works their way through a system not unlike getting a bill passed through Congress, but hopefully without as much money changing hands. The source, uh, this sixth source proposal, <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> um, this, this source was, of course, widely promoted, as you might guess, by the Covenant of UU Pagans, those groups, Congregational Environmentalist groups, Green Sanctuary groups. There was a lot of support behind it. But despite all of that support, the vote to adopt the sixth source in, at the 1995 General Assembly was still pretty contentious. Um, according to Edward Frost, a guy who chronicled this event, he said that many felt that the Earth-centered traditions were already included in the seventh principle, that's the interdependent web, and in the source they all, we already had regarding world religions. And then he says that less academic objections included characterizing the amendment proposers as witches, at which point the witches in the room probably all went, yeah, so what? <laughs> I'm just imagining that. Um, so this shows that Unitarian Universalists aren't always as the theologically open-minded as they profess to be, even about people in our own faith community. But the Earth-centered tradition source, the sixth source, did pass by a vote of 735 to 358. And although that might seem like a landslide, the vast majority, it only just narrowly passed the two-thirds majority required to change the UU bylaws and then officially adopt it as a source. And following the vote, when the vote was successful, a Native American delegate of Crow heritage in full Native dress rose to declare that he was a Unitarian Universalist and that the assembly had voted to include his heritage. So unlike that enthusiastic Native American UU, I did not grow up with Earth-centered religion. I grew up in the suburbs. As a child, my exposure to nature was pretty much in the backyard, involving a lot of playing outside. One of my biggest outdoor adventures was sledding in the winter. We sledded at this place the local kids called Snaky Mountain. And it was basically, it was not a mountain, it was basically a very large hill right next to our neighborhood. And it made for some really good sledding. And I think it was called Snaky Mountain because the path down the hill was not straight. You had to avoid trees the whole way down. And if you made it without hitting a tree and picked up enough speed, you would actually end up in a creek bed, not only in the snow, but in the water as well. And whenever that happened, it was awesome. 
And, you know, as a child, I really enjoyed the beach exploration part of going to the beach on vacation. I liked nature trails and caves when I got to experience them. My favorite place in Washington, D.C., our, na our nation's capital, has always been and will probably continue to be the National Zoo. In high school, I took a totally elective environmental science class just because of all the hands-on nature stuff involved in it. We identified plants and trees and birds, and our big field trip was to Assateague Island off the eastern shore of Virginia, where we did hands-on study on just about every marine ecosystem out there, including getting knee-deep in gray mud in a salt marsh. Again, it was awesome. Growing up, nobody really encouraged me, you know, about this, it just kind of happened. I subscribed to National Wildlife Magazine and World Wildlife Magazine, the ones with all the great pictures, but I also read them cover to cover, and I dreamed about all those exotic places and all those animals, many of which I will never live to see. I did a lot of my school speeches on endangered species and environmental protection, and again, no one was pushing me towards those topics. I was just kind of drawn to them. And I've always experienced that feeling that I'm sure many of you can relate to, that feeling we get when we're in nature, that feeling of being a, tiny, being a tiny part of something so big and so beautiful, the awe and wonder from watching animals do whatever animals do and watching the rolling surf or just kind of lying there and staring up into the branches of trees. Yet I can't remember talking about any of these things in my United Methodist upbringing. And nature was actually a way I could easily connect to something bigger, to what some might call the divine. But it was never really talked about in Sunday school or in church service. But despite my affinity for nature, when I came to Unitarian Universalism, I really didn't know much about Earth-centered traditions at all. But the threads were already there. They were kind of ready to be woven into this tapestry that would become my personal theology. And when I discovered the sixth source of Unitarian Universalism, I thought it had been there forever because it just made so much intuitive sense to me. Now the congregation I joined, uh, First Unitarian Universalist Church of Richmond, Virginia, was famously humanist. But there were several Earth-centered practitioners in that congregation, but they kept a pretty low profile. It turns out many, many years before, maybe 20, there was a pretty active pagan group in the church, and they just happened to meet in the church basement, um, which was just a normal meeting place. A lot of groups met there. But somehow in the local community, we became the church that had witches in the basement. <laughs> and like most urban legends, it didn't make much sense. Were they trapped in the basement? Did they live in the basement? Um, you know, it, it was strange, but literally, Decades after the fact, I could hear someone walking through our parking lot from the park back home saying, you know, that's the church with the witches in the basement. So, so yeah, I mean, again, this shows about Earth-centered traditions and you say pagan or Wiccan, and people just kind of get weird ideas um, when they really should not. But like most of my home congregation, I was at first a little bit skittish and a little, little anxious about doing rituals. I didn't really see myself as a ritual person because any Christian ritual I had been involved in was usually pretty uncomfortable for me, and all ritual in general tended to bring up a lot of uncomfortable memories. But I slowly realized that it wasn't the ritual that I was uncomfortable with. It was the doctrine associated with those early rituals I had done. Ritual without the doctrine behind it can actually be quite liberating and pretty enjoyable. And as I continue to learn more about these Earth-centered traditions, the thing that strikes me most is how truly grounding they are. Now, Margot Adler said it's UUism that keeps her Earth-centered self grounded in the current realities of the world, but I kind of think she's selling Earth-centered religions a bit short because these traditions are not all about otherworldly things. I mean, they are literally grounded in the ground we stand on. That's why we call it Earth-centered, right? you don't really get much more grounded than earth-centered. I mean, the wheel of the year, the cycles of the seasons, they take us back to our agricultural roots, to times when people had to actually notice what was going on outside to eat in order to survive. I mean, this is something that we, as a society, most of us have been so completely detached from. 
And doesn't it make it sense to appreciate and celebrate what is here around us, what is happening on the earth right now? When to plant, when to harvest, when to celebrate, when to contemplate, when to take action, and when to rest. Getting back in touch with our ancestors and with our planet is incredibly grounding and connective. But in our path to modernity, we lost some of our ancestors' important rites of passage and lost the rituals that keep us focused and grounded in the moments of our lives that seem to just pass so, so quickly. So for me, even though I'm relatively new to Earth-centered traditions and still learning and still integrating them into my personal theology, and I still have a long way to go, it's a happy lifetime exploration. I'm here in a community where there are many teachers so I can continually learn and contemplate and integrate. The process never stops. I can say that I've probably always been a little pagan and didn't know it. Nature has always touched something inside me and encouraged a sense of reverence that has made me feel more alive. Sometimes the best way when I get too into my head is to go outside, the way to fix that. Nature is a source of grounding and it's a source of healing and it's a source of connecting to something greater, however you may define that something greater. And it can open that direct line to the connection with the ancestors and their almost lost traditions. And yet it's another of so many ways we Unitarian Universalists may employ a broad range of theologies to derive hope and meaning and purpose in our lives. So again, I, this week I will ask you to think about how nature and earth-centered traditions might inform your personal theology. How does nature and the spiritual tradi traditions based on nature, how can they or how do they bring you hope and meaning and purpose? The answer will not be the same for everyone and that's what makes all of this so fascinating. As you use, as we finish up with our six sources, I still just cannot say enough how fortunate we are to have them. So many wells from which we can draw spiritual wisdom. And when the sources are employed through study and contemplation and learning from and engaging with others, as well as spiritual practice, you know, we can't help but become more spiritually and emotionally mature. Levels of consciousness and our ability, ability to accept everyone, everything, and whatever life throws at us goes up. The black and white world becomes a world traded for shades of gray. Either ors become both ands. Our capacities for connection increase. Our rigidity and, and resistance go down. We gain roots to ground us and wings to set us free. And it's all here, laid out before us in six sources, an opportunity to engage in our individualized and collective, free and responsible search for truth and meaning. So let's make the most of it. <laughs>